Um, hey everybody. Wait, happy you Monday! You go say something, Wendy. Oh yeah, I forgot to give you the microphone. Oh, is it on? Yeah. Test one, two. I don't see me moving them down. Oh, there I go. How's everybody doing today? Fun? Good weekend? Beautiful weather. Tomorrow, uh, today, today or tomorrow, first day of fall. Yay, our favorite time. Gotta please. love it. It's coming, Wendy. It's coming. So today we're going to talk a lot about one of our really neat animals. A lot? I mean, you said that we were going to talk a lot, but what yes. are we talking a lot about? You didn't, like, explain. We're going to talk an ocelot about some really neat... We have two we're going to share, and there's some amazing things going on, and we're going to go kind of take you to their space a little bit. So I think you're going to learn lots a lot today about some really cool stuff. What are we going to learn a lot about? I mean, you're... I, I'm so confused. You said it was a perfect opportunity to nope. learn a lot. Right? I said it's perfect ocelot opportunity. Oh, you were playing on words, weren't you? Oh, well, we give it a try. Oh, oh, you're silly. So we're going to make a point. How about that one, guys? It is Monday. I think it's too early for a dad joke, Steve. It's Monday. Let's call Kim. Let's call Keeper Kim. Let's see if Keeper Kim is ready. I bet she is. Ready? Education jerkin to Keeper Van Spronson. Kim, we've said hello to our guests and we'd like to see you and the cats. Thanks, Kim. Jerkin, clear. I am so excited. So, question for you. Those of you who turned, tuned in last week, we said it was going to be a perfect day. How many of you thought we were going to Lion? Do you guys think we're going to Lion? That was a hint. Perfect. Can lions purr? Nope. Nope. Why can't lions purr, Steve? Because the, the structure of their throat does not allow them to purr. They can only roar. So we gave, gave you guys a little bit of a hint. It's probably not much of a hint because you guys have been with us for so long and you know all this stuff already. So that's really cool. So we got something going on here. Keeper Kim's going to come out. Pardon the glare, guys. I'm going to have to get real close to you. Yeah, so pardon the glare a little bit. So Keeper Kim's going to be putting... This is Keeper Kim. You met, if you guys remember, you met Keeper Kim with an, uh, an animal of the night. <laughs> when they made me dress really funny. Yeah, they made you. <laughs> I you heard Kim. She said, yeah, they made you? <laughs> yes, Kim, they made me. <laughs> So, Kim, we're going to talk to Kim about what she's doing when she comes back out front. We're going to be lucky enough to talk with Kim um, when she comes back out. But you guys know what she's doing. What is she throwing out there? What is the sciency word? What is the zoo word? We know it's fish. We know it's mice. What's that zoo word? What is she providing for the animal right now? It's not really the diet. Oh, it's part of their diet. What is she providing the animal in the zoo world? Oh, putting out some fur, it looks like. I can't wait to ask her about all this stuff. She's providing enrichment. Remember, enrichment, those things that we provide for the animals that encourage them to do the things they would do in the wild. Looking at behaviors. So it's not just putting stuff out. I see meat, Steve. You do see meat? Yep. Awesome. Let's find out what kind of meat that is when Keeper Kim comes out. Oh, little spray bottle. Oh, i got to find out what that is. So what she's doing is she's trying to elicit these natural behaviors from the, from the ocelots. And you're going to meet, hopefully you're going to meet two. Oh, Kim said, all right, we'll be right out. So Kim's done her job. She's done her roles. Put, her, put the enrichment out there. And now the cats are going to come from some weird hole in the wall. Where is it? Uh, I don't know. Let's see if they come out. We're looking for two ocelots, a male and female. I can't tell them apart. So you keep them to help with that. You're breaking up a little bit. How's that? A little bit better? I don't know what's causing it, but you're breaking up a little bit. How's that? If I start talking a little closer? That's better. I was standing away from the camera for a second. Let's see if that's better. So we'll keep working on that with you guys. And like most cats. Yep. 
they're going to come out on their own precious time. <laughs> That's for sure. And Wendy, remind, remind our guests, you used to work uh, in the desert habitat. We are kind of right outside the desert habitat of North Carolina Zoo. Yes, you used I, to work here. I was. I actually had, Kim, Kim and I worked together as keepers. I was here for 10 years wow. as a mammal keeper here at the desert habitat. And I was lucky enough to work with both of these ocelots for a few of those years. Not in this habitat. I got to help design yeah. this habitat. Oh, fun. But by the time I left and came to education, um, it wasn't built yet. Oh. So, so Kim, uh, when Kim, when I left, Kim took over yeah. the mammals. And uh, I think you, we've seen Keeper Cat. Yes. Uh, Keeper Cat Keeper and Clawson. Keeper Kim yep. um, have been Had the Taken over that role, huh? Yep. We're still waiting for the cats. Well, you know, they are cats, as you mentioned earlier, so eloquently. Oh, I see some movement in the back. I think you're going to see one coming to the right. There I see her. How about that? How do you know it's her? Definitely Inca, I'm assuming, because uh, Diego, came out first. <laughs> Diego really is very, very shy. So there's Inca. We do have a few guests here. Hi, everybody. Hi. How's everybody doing out there? You can come up to the glass. Don't be shy. So cool. So is she interact? What's she? Oh, she interact with the ball a little bit. Yeah, she got some. I'm assuming. I think some meat out of it. A little climb over there. If Diego doesn't come out, he's not gonna get anything, is he? No. He's, he's gonna have to be eating just his regular diet. The enrichment put out there, encouraging them to do again, forage for their food, looking for their food. The ocelot is a hunter. They are a predator. Very good one. Mm-hmm. They're flying back there. Today we're going to talk to you guys about, we're going to go away from the zoo a little bit. We're going to talk about their range, kind of their, their habitat, some of the unfortunate threats to the ocelot, and a little bit of what's going on here at the North Carolina Zoo to kind of help these guys survive a pretty challenging time for them, especially in the United States. She's hiding behind the grass. There she, she comes. comes again. Let's see if she'll check some things. Back to the ball. Oh, I got to get it. Oh, what's in there? Reaching in. Just like she might do, reaching into a log or something to grab some. Reaching into the hole to grab something out. So that's pretty successful enrichment right there. A little bit of, little bit of behavior going on. Got to use some problem-solving skills. Got to get up inside and do. Oh, might be getting some close-ups here now. There she is. Beautiful cat. What'd you find? She is. She's taking it all. We'll have to tell Keeper Kim that Diego's missing out. Look at that beautiful pattern, Steve. They're unique, right, Wendy, in that they have spots and stripes. They have a little bit of everything, plus that rosette that yep. we see with jaguars. Kind of the spots around spots. That's what a rosette is. Spot around a spot. She go. She's up here already. <laughs> and then they have those little white spots on the back of their ears. It helps the females and the babies kind of follow each other. Helps the babies follow the female. They can follow those white spots. And then it looks like there's eyes back there. Oh, look at her go. A little natural history on these guys since she's showing it off. They are excellent climbers. Duh. You guys are like, Steve, I see that. They're excellent climbers. They've got a really good jumping skill as well. And get this. Get this. They like the water. I think she's finding it. I see it. Do you see it? She's got it. Boom. Keeper Kim's here. Hi. Hi, Keeper Kim. <laughs> you find a lot of her treats? Oh, she yeah. found all the treats. Oh, Diego said, you know what? I'm done. Diego's, yeah, he's not ready to come out. <laughs> he's not a morning cat. He's not. He's really a day cat. So <laughs> he, just, he just waits until everyone's gone. He comes nice. out at night. So, yeah, so she's kind of staking up all the food, all the enrichment that's out there. What kind of things did you put out there for our guests? We saw some look at reaching to the water. <laughs> so I put most of her diet out, the fish and the mice okay. and some meat bones but also some um more scent oriented things like 
bison fur. It puts high rack. Bison rate. fur? Mm -hmm. No kidding. Is that the little brown stuff you're putting yep. in? That, that rock. And cool. Then, and high racks fur. We had some high racks yep. fur. Um, I put out some perfume. They really love this. Wait, 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 wait. You put out <laughs> perfume for the ocelot? Yeah. Do they have like a favorite? They do. Nuh uh. Um, yeah, they love Lady Stetson. <laughs> 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 they love Lady Stetson. I, I didn't pick it. They you didn't pick it. it. They picked it, right? <laughs> they picked it. <laughs> and that's to, to kind of stimulate that scenting around because they are like their scent marking. I know that for yep. the ranges and habitats. Yeah. So just another way to kind of stimulate a behavior that they might be doing in the wild. Yeah. Neat. And she is. Well, she's reaching in that water, isn't she? <laughs> Looking good. We're going to talk about a little bit about their range. They're really, really rare in the United States. Mm -hmm. They're an endangered species in the United States, right? Locally. I say locally. They're found in Texas primarily. Yep, southern Texas. Yep. I think I've got a map here somewhere. I want to share this map. Excuse me. That's their size. She's full grown. She's almost 16 years old. Check this out. So they're pretty common down in Central and South America as you go through here. But you look up here, they're really rare in the United States. Really only in texas that very tiny tiny tip where that red dot is that's you guys the see that? only place you can find ocelots in north america they are so endangered that's an amazingly endangered species and lots of threats with these guys we're trying to do some cool stuff though we're going to talk about wildlife corridors a little bit later on it's kind of neat to share that with you but their ranges they're really much more common in the south much more common in um Argentina and Brazil. So internationally, they're not really endangered, but in the United States, they are a critically endangered cat. And anything that impedes where they get to go, any kind of barriers that impede them from going from one place to jump, watch the jump, yes! Can really impact these guys. So the United States and other places are looking at wildlife corridors spaces put together you're gonna you gonna jump down there little kitty to connect habitats to connect habitats. the wildlife corridors are for that that microphone is real we playing i think it's the wind oh that could be it does have a wind sock on it is that better yes so i need to stay close to you you okay with that yeah so we'll talk about the wildlife corridors. We actually have a little image we'll share with you in a little bit about those corridors. But one of the big problems with their habitat is that it's fragmented. It's fragmented. What might that mean if a fragmented habitat? Well, especially this North American species. So there's, yeah. there's roughly, and they might have changed it since I was a keeper, there's roughly nine subspecies of Holy ocelot. cow. And maybe our, our, uh, our education staff that's helping answer questions uh, for our guests, if they can check that for me. But there should be nine subspecies of ocelots, and our North American subspecies is the most endangered. Wow. I didn't realize there were so many subspecies. Yeah, there are less than 50 in North America. And a subspecies is a type, right? A yeah. type of ocelot. Could be looking at color variation. You could be looking at size. And for us, it's habitat. Habitat. So those those ocelots in South America. Man, we're right in the glare where she's at. <laughs> those ocelots in South America are more of a rainforest cat. Oh, really? Okay. And our subspecies is more of a desert cat. Got you. So they're found in those those dry, scrub brushy areas of Texas. Nice. And they can migrate down into Mexico. So may I ask Keeper Kim a question? No, no. Oh no? You are Take it too far away from the microphone. So you've got to come to me this time, Kim. The habitat that's been created for the for the ocelots. Mm -hmm. Some really neat things in there. Can you kind of give us a, a mini walkthrough kind of thing <laughs> of some of the things that are in there for the cats to kind of interact with and play with? Yeah, um, so the, the whole tree in the center was is not real. That was designed that's by our... That's built? Mm -hmm. Our design department did Holy that cow. in house. And um, they're super good climbers, so that's obviously there. Wow. She's climbing right now. Yeah. It's obviously there for them to be able to kind of show us their climbing skills. Um, we keep adding more and more um, bushes and shrubs and stuff oh, because really? they really need some place to hide, especially in the day. Um, every 
habitat that they occupy, the one thing it has in common is there's a lot of cover. So okay. that's what we do to kind of make them as comfortable as possible out here. We give them a lot of bushes and shrubs to hide under. So our, when our guests come, they really need to pause at this habitat. need to look around. Yeah, they're hard to spot a lot of times, but, um, you know, they're almost always out here. They're just kind of hard to find. Hard to spot, hard to find. So take that to, <laughs> take that to heart, guys. Sometimes people come to the zoo, any zoo for that matter, that's putting out enrichment, that's kind of setting up their animals for success, you're not going to see them. They're not going to be sitting in the middle of the space all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you do need to kind of pause and look around and think, hmm, if I was a cat, if I was an ocelot, where would I be in this space? Would I be in a log? Would I be under a bush? Would I be towards the back? Would I be up high? Nice save there. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Inca since she's the one who came out to visit with us today. Yeah, Inca is our female ocelot. She's going to be 16 years old here 16. in a couple of months. Yeah, which is pretty old for an ocelot. Um, in captivity and uh, under human care, that's um, not not as old, but, you know, they have a lot of veterinary care and special oh, diets sure. and less predators and stuff here. Yep. So she and her mate, Diego, have mm -hmm. been here for a number of years, and they've had um, quite a few number of kittens. Really? Um, she's probably past that age now. Mm, yeah. that <laughs> and you said the lady Stetson, huh? Yeah, That's actually, Diego's the one who really loves that. Oh, really? He rubs all over and kind of goes nuts. No for kidding. It. That's so neat. He didn't want to come out and play today, so. I was I was at a zoo once, and they would put perfume in the water and freeze it in ice cubes. Ooh, that's a good idea. And kind of sprinkle it around for the animal because then it would melt and it would, the smell would be released over time. Yeah, that's a great. There's another way to kind of think about how to do this enrichment, which is so exciting and so important to the cats to encourage that natural What's behavior. What's cool too is they have heated rocks in here uh -uh. for in the winter time because you wait. know we are an all season zoo. Oh no, there you go. Okay, I was saying I know the polar bears have cooled rock. We met yeah. that. We saw that. Yeah. You guys, you have a really cool treat coming up for you guys in two weeks. We get to we went inside the polar bear habitat. Yes. <laughs> um, so they actually have heated rocks. Yes. That's so cool. They have a cave over here to our left, which yeah. we'll show a little later that they can out. go in and be a dark space. So okay. if she had, uh, when she did have kittens, she could take them in there and feel more, more den like. What a great shot there. She came up to say, hey. And I think Kim and I can both definitely agree how much we learned from Inca as a mother. Oh yeah. She's an awesome mom. Yeah. She is. What makes her an awesome mom? mom? I mean, that's. I can see, you know, in our world, but what makes an what makes a ocelot an awesome mom? Well, I mean, we learn in, in classes when we're getting our degrees about animal mothers and yeah, what sure. they're supposed to do and what they're supposed to teach it. But you you learn that in a book, but when you yep. can see it in real life, we actually can see her teach her teach her kittens balance. Oh, no teach kidding. her kittens to stay. She will drag that kitten over, she will you know, smack it in the head when it's doing something wrong. <laughs> She'll um, yell at it when it's not she doing yells She'll yell at it, it. really? Yeah. No kidding. She disciplines. Uh, my favorite thing I ever saw her do, uh, one of the kittens, it Checking was years ago, uh, was on a log. Yeah. And she literally pushed it on purpose so it would be off balance. So it would use its claws to hold itself in place. Really? It was amazing. She is an amazing mom. She's very protective. And we treat them as if they were wild. So sure. these guys were a breeding pair. We we treated those kittens like they were a wild kitten, and mom taught them how to be a cat. Okay. And but you said that Inca's a little too old now to be breeding. Yep, she's kind of past her prime in terms of breeding. But she, you know, she had six litters and and wow, or six kittens that she passed their genes on to. So she's yep. kind of done her job. So she's well represented. Her she genes is. are kind of well. -represented out there i assume diego as well yeah actually, at that instance they, they still want more genes from diego really so. wow so in a case like that um i know it's always it's it's always so hard to talk about digital guests because remember the aza they're the ones who kind of move animals around we don't make some of those decisions so we have some animals that are on birth control if we don't want them to breed some animals that have been um, literally fixed to make sure they can't breed um, so let's say that let's say they want diego to continue breeding he would either have to go somewhere else or Inca would have to go somewhere else. So those are kind of the decisions that are made at a level above even the North Carolina Zoo sometimes. Nice little leap. And that's tough on the keepers sometimes, you might imagine. You build these bonds, you build these relationships with your animals, but you're doing everything for the 
greater good of the species. Yeah, the betterment of the it's species. It's not just the individual, and you're doing it for the individual too. The enrichment's for the individual, the breeding for the individual sometimes, the habitat design for the individual sometimes. And especially if you think about this species, because in our lifetime, yeah. these guys will not exist in the wild. There is less than 50, most or likely seven. less than 40 in the wild. In the United States. In the United States. So what, what zoos are doing, AZA accredited zoos are doing, is they will still live on sure. in zoos, in Love AZA it. accredited zoos. So they Love won't it. go extinct. Right. So that's why these guys are, and like Diego is such an important breeder. Because they are the subspecies. He, he's part of the subspecies from the United States. Yes. Awesome. And they live in all those. So we've learned they kind of live in that Central and South America up to the United States. And the, we mentioned they have they have habitats, almost all the different types of habitat, any kind of habitat or ecosystem or biome that you can imagine. These guys live there. Yep. That's amazing. They're going from South, South America, all the way up to Texas. So imagine all those different habitats, guys that are up and down there. You've got tropical rainforests. You've got marshlands and swamplands. You've got deserts. You have forests. You've got jungles. The ocelot found in all of those amazingly adapted to survive in, those, in those, all those varied habitats. And again, come back to some of the skills. They can climb. They can jump. And as I said, they can even swim. Really unique for a cat. They do call ocelots the most adaptable cat. I believe it. All the different places. And then their diet is crazy varied. Yeah. It's crazy varied, guys. This little cat is a hunter. So he's a carnivore. He's a predator. I'll show you the skull. Look at this. We've seen, some of you may have seen the skull before. May I? Check this skull out. This is so cool. This is a replica skull. It's not real, but it's the exact size and shape of a, of, a, of a normal skull. But look at those teeth. Look at these canines. These are the, those are the killing teeth right there. Those are the killing teeth. And remember these sharp cutting teeth back here? Those carnassial molars for getting right next to, getting right next to the fur, <laughs> getting right next to the skin to get, to get whatever meat they can off of there. So that amazing predator hunter skull, eyes in the front to judge distance. We haven't talked about that before. So having these forward facing eyes is really important so they can judge distance, how far away something is or how close something is helps really figure out, can I go after that or not? Should I wait and see if it'll come a little bit closer? And then the gorgeous camouflage. That coat is amazing and it's not just pretty, it is really adaptive for them. They can see, they can hide, I say see, they can hide in so many various habitats. Why is that camouflage so important to them? Why do you think Camouflaged predators are camouflaged. I can understand it all the time in a prey species. I want to hide so you can't see me. I want to hide so you can't find me. But flip that. Why would a predator, those sharp teeth, sharp claws, speed sometimes? Why do they need to be camouflaged? Why do they need to hide? Yeah, exactly. Some of our guests are here. Absolutely. You don't want your prey to see you so you can sneak up and get a little closer and a little closer. You don't want to waste that effort, waste that time going after a prey item if it's too far away. So if I can sneak up on you and slowly get closer and closer and closer, I can rely on my camouflage to do that. So it's really important for these guys to have that amazing camouflage. And we're talking about like this, de this would be more of a desert cat. You can yep. see her coat is more of a, like a tawny brown color, sort of a lighter oh, great point. beige. Yep. That rainforest ocelot is going to have more of a darker color, a little bit more orangish, just a little darker. So yep. because the light sources are different in the rainforest versus sure. the desert. That makes perfect sense. And come back to those ranges for a second. From from the southern tip of South America through Texas. So imagine all those things that have to happen through there, all the different habitats. For the cat itself, their home range is tremendously large. The home range of this cat is really, really big. Both males and females. Females will defend their territories. 
Males will scent mark. We what do we use to to, to kind of defend our territory? What are we using to defend our territory, so to speak? Fences. Fences. We're using a fence, right? We use a fence. We're not having to go around scent marking our territory. That would be really weird or if scratching. your neighbor was out peeing <laughs> in the corners of his yard. So, whew, good thing we don't have to scent mark our spaces like that. It's awesome that the that we're able to build the fences. So those amazing ranges, 75 feet. <laughs> 75 feet, listen to me. When you looked at me like, what did you just say? 75 mi square miles, possibly. Um, all that marked up. Females defending their territories, males' ranges are larger, and they may overlap with many females, but not the males. They're going to really fight and keep those se se spaces separated from the other males. We want to show you these. Remember we talked about these wildlife corridors? We mentioned that. Let's go talk about these wildlife corridors. Don't want to run over <laughs> <any> <laughs> At my size, I definitely want to do it. The donation button is up. We had someone donate. No kidding. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much. I know it's difficult right now, but any every little penny helps. The zoo still has its limited number of people coming in every week. Um, we are open, of course, um, but we have time to ticket still. We are asking you to wear masks when you're at a lot of the overlook. That's when we're asking you to really wear the mask. So in between, you can take a breath, you can take it down until you get into groups. And we ask you to put your mask on when you're at like an overlook or within a group. But here's some of the conservation efforts that the zoo is somewhat involved with. Now we're not doing this in, in, in um, Texas or in South America yet. But wildlife corridors, you have a space that's available for an animal. You have a space that's available for an animal. But in that fragmented habitat, it's separate. It's not all put together. So if you can build a corridor between the two, you provide an opportunity for the animals to get from one space to another, looking for food, looking for mates, looking for water, looking for safety from time to time. And at the zoo, we've done some of this in our, some of our local habitat, some of our local spaces, and we have these really cool cameras set up to identify what's where, to see who's in the area. So camera traps, camera locations are able to spot animals that are in your habitat, that are in your space, maybe using those wildlife corridors. And I think we have so, a photo of ocelots using those corridors. Oh, we do? We I should have brought it with. There. Yeah. But we wanted to share that with you because it's something that the zoo is part of that can translate to other locations that other people are doing, other scientists are doing, looking at those types of um, habitat challenges that some animals have right now, trying to connect those corridors, to connect those habitats with the corridor. Let's see if I can track down a picture real quick. Oh, you've got to come with me, don't you? I keep forgetting I can't walk away from you. I'm going to duck down right here. You're fine, you're fine. Not a worry. We're taking space. Octopus and stuff, it's right at the very beginning. Showing them the sign. <laughs> That's a little longer. I can't get my fingernails underneath it to pick it up. So there's an image. Whoops, sorry. There's an image of an ocelot using a wildlife corridor. You can see it right down here, using that wildlife corridor. And if people have ever been to Yellowstone or some of the uh, western states and up in the northeast, they have wildlife corridors that go over roads yep. for like herds of elk and bigger animals. But for these animals, they're not going to go over a road. Got to go under. They need to go under because they're secretive. That's so neat. I've seen them for um, even herps, reptiles, yeah. and amphibians to go under roads. I think that's so cool. Canada does a lot of that, and they actually have natural ways to go over some of those spaces. Really amazing things. People think about ways to save animals in spaces that need a little bit more help. I'm glad to have that. Yeah. We have a really nifty craft for you. I can't keep her Kim put. You're good. Can't keep keep Kim said she's good. She's like I'm not quite as as. Here's our craft for today. Wow. And there's multiple choices. <laughs> because I can't roar.
<laughs> Try this one. Those of you that like to color, those of you that have those coloring books, relaxing, peaceful. Now you can make something from it and share with other people too. Almost has that Mexican Day of the Deadish. It's from uh, the inspiration was Cinco de Gato. Cinco de Gato. So uh, on Cinco de Mayo is a fundraiser sure. for ocelots. It's called Cinco de Gato. Oh, fun! That's kind of neat. The one last thing we didn't talk about, we did. We mentioned it, so I don't want to let it kind of hang. We talked about with their diet. Didn't want to go into what they eat. They eat everything, small mammals, up through even deer. Guys, we saw the teeth. Even deer can be taken by an ocelot if they find one that they can catch. But it extends to fish and crabs, especially during the wet season of some of their habitats. Other herps, other snakes, maybe frogs and toads, but small rodents primarily, small mammals primarily make up their diet. I don't want to let that kind of go without, without mentioning it. So today we got to talk about some really cool stuff, especially learned, a, learned an ocelot about the ocelot. How about that? Bye, Gotta love with those puns. Um, we talked about their range and their habitat, how they're critically endangered in the United States. A little bit of diet. Keeper Kim was kind enough to tell us a little bit about the space and how it's set up for the, to make these guys successful. Um, learned a little bit more about enrichment, saw some of the cool things that Keeper Kim put out, and we got to watch Inca get involved with that. We haven't got into, we have a neat, neat shout out for you guys today. We're going to shout out, Wendy and I are going to shout out to the zookeepers here at the North Carolina Zoo. To make this whole thing work, we need their help. And they've all been so accommodating to say, okay, what do you want us to do? What do you, how can we help? We are so lucky to oh, have my these goodness. guys. They make these adventures so much fun and educational and so great for you guys at home. Yeah, it's amazing. So from Wendy and myself to all of our keeper friends, we truly appreciate all the help you guys are giving us making these successful and bringing these animals that much closer to our digital guests. So thank you guys so very much. Keeper friends here at the North Carolina Zoo. Uh, Wednesday is a taped episode. We're going from small to small. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to get a kick out of these guys. There's some really neat things as we jump around from animal to animal. Um, That's a good one, Steve. So tune in Wednesday, 10 o'clock for your zoo adventures. Remember with you, Mondays and Wednesdays. Monday is almost always live. Wednesdays is, uh, is often taped, but we're still there live answering questions as you guys have seen in the past. We are open, asking you to wear a mask when you come to centers like this. Time to ticket, so make sure you order them ahead of time. You guys stay safe. We can't wait to see you here at the North Carolina Zoo in the future. Bye.